Hi there. Today we are talking about a truck that never tried to look heroic, never pretended to be fast, and never chased applause. And yet, quietly and stubbornly, it changed the future of commercial transport. The Mercedes-Benz Low 2000 did not enter history with noise. It entered history with numbers, fuel bills, and very uncomfortable questions for its competitors. The Low 2000 appeared in 1932, right in the middle of the Great Depression. Businesses were struggling, transport companies were counting every liter of fuel, and optimism was in short supply. Daimler-Benz understood one simple truth. This was not the time for flashy machines. This was the time for vehicles that could survive economically. The Low 2000 was born from that reality. The name itself tells you everything. Low stood for a light truck series, and 2000 referred directly to its payload class, 2000 kilograms. No exaggeration, no romantic names, no marketing fairy tales. Just a clear message. This truck carries two tons, does the job, and goes home. Now here comes the first real confrontation, diesel versus petrol. In the early 1930s, light trucks almost universally used petrol engines. Diesel was considered too rough, too slow, too heavy, and frankly too unpleasant for everyday commercial work. Mercedes-Benz ignored that mindset completely. The low 2000 became the first light production truck in the world offered with a diesel engine as standard. That decision alone made many competitors uncomfortable. Under the hood was the OM59 engine, a four-cylinder diesel with a displacement of 3.8 liters. Power output was 55 horsepower. Not impressive on paper, but torque told a different story. The engine delivered approximately 200 newton meters of torque, around 148 pound-feet, and it delivered it low in the rev range. This meant no rushing, no drama, no constant gear changes, just steady pulling power, hour after hour. Mercedes did offer a petrol version as well, using a four-cylinder petrol engine with similar power output. It ran smoother and quieter, and drivers liked it. But here came the second confrontation, economy versus speed. The petrol truck felt livelier, but it drank fuel noticeably faster. In a time when fuel costs could decide whether a business survived or collapsed, that mattered more than comfort. Operators did the math, again and again and the diesel kept winning. Power was sent to the rear axle through a four-speed manual gearbox. Top speed was around 65 kilometers per hour, approximately 40 miles per hour. By modern standards, that is slow. By 1932 standards, for a fully loaded truck, it was acceptable. More importantly, the low 2000 could maintain that speed without overheating or mechanical protest. Many competitors could sprint briefly. The Mercedes could work all day, Payload capacity was officially 2,000 kilograms, but in real-world conditions, the truck often carried more. The ladder frame chassis was robust, conservative, and deliberately over-engineered. Mercedes engineers assumed owners would overload the truck, and they designed it accordingly. That reserve strength became one of the low 2000s quiet advantages. Dimensionally, the truck was well-suited for both city and regional work. Overall length was about 6.2 meters, approximately 20.3 feet. Width measured around 2.1 meters, approximately 6.9 feet. And height was also roughly 2.1 meters, approximately 6.9 feet, depending on body style. The wheelbase was about 3.8 meters, around 12.5 feet, providing stability without sacrificing maneuverability. This brings us to the third confrontation. German logic versus old habits. Many operators were used to buying petrol trucks because that's how it has always been done. Mercedes challenged that thinking with something radical, long-term logic, lower fuel consumption, longer engine life, fewer stops, less stress. The low 2000 did not feel revolutionary while driving it. It felt boring. And boring in commercial transport is often a compliment. The low 2000 was designed as a platform rather than a single purpose vehicle. Flatbeds, box bodies, tankers, municipal service trucks, delivery vans, and even small buses were built on the same chassis. 
fire brigades, postal services, construction companies, and city authorities all found use for it. This flexibility made the model extremely attractive during uncertain economic times. Driving the low 2000 required patience and involvement. The cabin was upright and functional. Comfort was minimal. The suspension was firm, the seats basic, and long hours behind the wheel were physically demanding. Steering at low speeds required strength. Braking distances were long. The truck did not forgive careless driving, but it rewarded drivers who respected its rhythm. Fuel consumption was one of the strongest arguments in favor of the diesel low 2000. Compared to petrol trucks in the same class, it consumed significantly less fuel over long distances and daily stop and go routes. For small businesses, that difference could mean survival. In that sense, the low 2000 was not just a vehicle, it was a business decision. Production continued until 1940. In total, around 12,000 units were built and approximately 90% of them were diesel powered. That figure speaks louder than any advertisement. Buyers voted with their wallets and diesel won decisively. The low 2000 was not perfect. Cold starts could be difficult in early diesel versions. Noise and vibration were part of daily life. Speed was limited. Comfort was secondary. But none of this mattered to owners who needed reliability above all else. The truck did not promise excitement. It promised consistency. Today, the Mercedes-Benz Low 2000 stands as a milestone in commercial vehicle history. It did not change the world by force. It changed it by logic. It proved that diesel engines belonged not only in heavy trucks, but also in everyday commercial vehicles. It shifted expectations, habits, and ultimately the entire market. When you see a restored low 2000 today, you are looking at more than an old truck. You are looking at the moment when efficiency quietly defeated tradition. No revolution, no shouting, just a machine that worked better than the rest. If you enjoy stories like this, where practical machines quietly reshape history, make sure to subscribe. Many more forgotten workhorses are still waiting to be heard.